Welcome to Perceptions Today podcast, where we discuss consciousness in all forms. December 2021, Episode 6, Anthony Peake's Roundtable with the Public, Part 6 of 7. He is a writer who deals with the borderline areas of human consciousness. Going back to hallucinations, um, what could you uh, talk about as far as uh, audio hallucinations? Where well, I guess they're a little bit different than the visual ones. But uh, I remember hearing an NPR interview with a neuroscientist who was talking about it. And um, a lot of people have them but are afraid to talk about them because of the stigma attached to it. This is an instance of the conversation coming up in the roundtable discussion. Participants knew it was being recorded. But the problem is, you say, with the Plato's cave analogy and the escaped prisoner, it's how on earth you begin to explain the things that, that, that people will turn around and say, it's impossible. And they'll come up with all kinds of explanations. But they won't explain it for you because you know that's what happened. It's like my argument on in one of my books, um, I discuss hallucinations. And of course, people turn around and they will say, oh, it was an hallucination, as if that's an explanation. You know, <laughs> scientists right. do not know what hallucinations are. Again, if anybody's interested in the frustrations that sci real genuine scientists have, read the book Hallucinations by um, Oliver Sacks. In this book, he discusses just how strange hallucinations are. And I've taken one of his examples. You know, if I see, if I hallucinate a dog standing in front of me, there are two hallucinations going on there. There's the hallucination of the dog, but there's also the hallucination of extraction because the dog's body is excluding my visual field from seeing what's behind the dog. So there are two hallucinations going on there. And they'll turn around and they'll say, well, it's just a hallucination by definition is something that you experience that somebody else doesn't. Well and good. But if you and I, imaginal traveler, we both see a pink elephant walking down the street and we both look to each other and say, do you see that pink elephant? Science has an exact, has an, an answer for that. It's called a folie d'oeuvre. But effectively, it means that that pink elephant is external to both of us. So either the external elephant can only be explained by telepathy, which, of course, science also doesn't agree with, or, they're hot, they're, in other words, they use one thing that they don't agree with to explain another. I call it the labelling theory of science. They give it a labelling theory. It's like, for instance, somebody... Is goes to see their doctor and they have a form of epilepsy. And the doctor turns around and said, we've done lots of checks and we've discovered you have idiopathic epilepsy. And the person will go away and go, wow, the doctors really know what they're talking about. I have idiopathic epilepsy. Idiopathic means we haven't got a bloody clue. That's what the <laughs> word means. It means of unknown origin and unknown source. So most of what happens in the brain is idiopathic as far as modern science goes, because they can't understand it. So therefore, they try to accommodate it. They try to diss it. They try to, to pretend that they kind of understand it, but don't by giving it nice labels, preferably Latin or Greek. So the man in the street and the hoi polloi won't necessarily understand and be impressed with it. And this is the game that is played. We are breaking that down. I ask questions. It, it's, you might be interested to know that on a number of occasions, I've been asked to speak at skeptics groups. A few years ago, I was invited to speak at the Skeptics Society at the University of Edinburgh. They invited me, and then three days before, they retracted the invite. The reason being that they wanted to set me up, they wanted to set up thinking I was some kind of new age wacko that channeled voices or believed in all kinds of nonsense and they felt that they could have a bit of fun with me until they started looking at my videos and looking at my interviews. And they said, oh, oh, this guy is Hang on not one second. Somebody... The audio started to go a bit dodgy. Did you hear that, Melissa, as well? I, I heard it, but I can, but he's... It came back. back. But... Yeah, I just yeah, thought yeah. I'd try and grab it before you lost your place. Thank you. Continue. So, so you know, they, they turned around and said that, no, we, we didn't want me. And it's because, and, and the lady who was involved admitted it, said that, that you scared them. You scared them because you're, you, you, can't, you can't be categorised and you can't, the, you, you can't be dismissed your ideas because you start from the science. 
And I'll finish off with um, an event that took place in New York about 12 years ago when I was invited to speak in New York. And I spoke um, at, in front of 300 people at, in the Roosevelt Hotel, which sadly recently closed, I heard, because of COVID, closed down forever. And I spoke in the, uh, the ballroom, which is where the American nominations for the presidency for the Democratic Party were always made. And indeed, it was the location where the Greed is Good speech was made and filmed in the movie Wall Street. And I'm standing there making this speech and I kept thinking this, God, my God, I'm, I'm, it's incredible, I'm Gordon Gecko. You know, it's quite, quite weird. Um, but halfway through the, 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 the presentation, a guy stood up in the middle of the audience and he said, um, I believe you're a charlatan. I believe that you pretend you understand because you have a very good memory and you, you're not just talking off the top of your head. You're making, you know, because you're not. Um, and I'm going to compromise you now because I'm going to throw you out of your your speech and I'm going to suggest that you explain to the audience here Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. So I did. And he sat there and it was as if somebody had shot him between the eyes. And I said to him, was I right? And he said, yes. And I said, can I speak to you afterwards? He ran away. That is what they're like. They think they know everything and they don't. We are the people who are thinking outside of the box and trying to come up with solutions. But there is a new breed of scientists coming up now and it's great. I'm now working with lots of postdoctoral researchers in various subjects, you know, from, from physicists to psychologists to neurologists. And we're starting to blow as our end knows with the people we work with in terms of breaking convention and everything else as well. And the DMT research, the balloon's going to go up soon and the world's going to change and we're going to start having real answers. That is really true about everything. And I think everybody that's been coming to our communities and the organic growth just proves that because they've come in, they've shared things once they found out that they thought it was a safe space Several of them have come in one week, didn't want to say anything. They texted us information to contribute. But then, say, the second week after that, they came in, started saying something. Third week, they came out and they were just as chatty as anything. And it's fantastic because we've had people come in and say, it's a little gem to find the community that we're building and interlocking with other people where there's no infighting, no raised voices. It's all contemplation. Everything's on the table to discuss and there's no rioting and we come back again and again and I'm just blown away. And again, Melissa will say the same. Absolutely. Um, and, and I love this community that's being built and, um, and I love that everyone loves coming back. It's, it's fantastic. That's lovely to hear. That really is. Right, okay, back to questions. Only if it's brief, you can have it and then tomorrow. Uh... Only oh. that was too short. I think you need a bit of longer <laughs> question than that. No, 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 no. Okay. No, 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 no. Uh, I was that, there was something with my speaker. Uh, Anthony, there, I'm gonna put you on the spot here with this question now. Uh, if okay. uh, if you are a person like me, uh, basically you kind of like uh, went in time in technology and come back slowly. Uh, uh, what's your view about visual reality based on uh, what you have spoke about uh, what's happening in our mind? Will this thing like uh, uh, kind of like uh, split our mind in form of like a, uh, we lost track of what is real? Uh, I, believe, I believe that virtual reality, um, particularly with recent develops with uh, the macroverse, um, which is quite an intriguing development in terms of super virtual reality. Um, I mean, I, I use virtual reality myself. I have a, an Oculus headset and the whole principle of virtual reality intrigues the life out of me because it's the one opportunity we have these days to actually turn around to somebody who is a realist reductionist and say, OK, you believe what you're perceiving is real and you believe that the external reality that you think is around you in three-dimensional reality is real. Put on a virtual reality headset and you can reproduce in three-dimensional space the feeling of existing somewhere else completely and utterly. 
And then you can use the analogy and say, well, it is you are effectively your body and your eyes and your ears are effectively a virtual reality headset that is creating the reality that you're perceiving around you now. And there is absolutely no way of proving otherwise. You know, there's the argument from solipsism that, you know, the only thing I really know is really true is that I'm something perceiving something. But the idea that external reality, there's a one-to-one -one relationship between external reality and what you perceive internally. There's a term for it. It's called naive realism. And this is what um, consciousness studies people call individuals who think that what they see and what they feel and what they are uh, uh, is, is, is actually what's out there. And I use the analogy, I call, I call it electromagnetic chauvinism. And what I say by that is that we believe that everything that there is, is what effectively is, is shown to us from our eyes. But our eyes are literally reacting to, as I said, photons of light or waves, depending on what they are, which are then created internally, as I said earlier on. But let's extrapolate a little bit from this. What photons are, in fact, are bosons. Bosons are subatomic particles that carry information, that carry things, and they carry the information field of the electromagnetic spectrum. Okay. Now, the electromagnetic spectrum, visible light is just a tiny part of the electromagnetic spectrum a tiny, tiny part. And I'll show you just how tiny this is, because in one of my books, I use this analogy and I was quite pleased with this because I think it works very effectively. Imagine that the electromagnetic spectrum, that is light in all its forms, which runs from radio waves at one end to gamma rays on the other. Okay, and imagine that's the Mississippi River in the United States. Now the Mississippi River starts as a tiny stream up in Minnesota. And you can cross it by jumping. There's a wonderful line in a song by the Indigo Girls that makes this comment that you can, you can cross it in, in, in so easily. And then it goes down through the middle of America and it comes out in the Gulf of Mexico. Okay. Now, if that was the electromagnetic spectrum, visible light would be one and a half inches, 18 miles south of Hannibal, Missouri. That is it. So if we believe that one and a half inches of the Mississippi River south of Hannibal, Missouri, is what is everything, I think we're being a little bit naive here, aren't we? There's much, much more out there. Now, I call it electromagnetic chauvinism because we believe this is what the reality is, is what we see. A bumblebee does not see the world as we see it. Not at all. And Thomas Nagel, um, a philosopher, a few years back, wrote an essay called What It Is Like to Be a Bat. And in this essay, it said, we can never get, ever get into the mind and the, 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 the worldview of a bat because a bat sees, like we were talking earlier on about synesthesia, a bat sees by bouncing sound waves off objects, but it sees it, it builds up a worldview based upon that. That's just as real as us seeing the world in the way we see it. You know, we don't see infrared, we don't see ultraviolet. We see photographs of the universe. And when it's, when it's shown in ultraviolet light, it looks completely different. But that's no more different than the way we see it. There is no pre preferred viewpoint of reality. It's what our senses give us. And our senses give us what is needed in order for us to survive within this environment, within this instantation, as my associate, Dr. Dr. Um, Andrew Gallimore calls it. The instantation, for want of a better term, the simulated reality that we live within. But Andrew and I use the word instantation because a simulation suggests it's a copy of something else, which it's not. But it is not what we think it is. It's far more interesting. And sometimes, as RN will say, when we take uh, DMT and everything else, the doors of perception are blown open and we see reality as it really is infinite. Oh, definitely. All that's going on. And I know the work that RN Voot's working on at the moment is going to be fantastic and jaw dropping. Again, if you haven't gone to his website, people, if you're new to it, go and look up his bio on Twitter. 
and then go and look up the reviews that are on Amazon for his books. Again, podcasts as well. Also, Tamara, you haven't had the opportunity to talk yet, so please take the floor. Uh, well, um, going back to hallucinations, um, what could you uh, talk about as far as uh, audio hallucinations? Where well, I guess they're a little bit different than the visual ones. But uh, I remember hearing an NPR interview with a neuroscientist who was talking about it. And um, a lot of people have them but are afraid to talk about them because of the stigma attached to it. Yeah, it's something we discussed earlier in terms of I was discussing this very subject and talking about um, the writings of um, Julian James and his work on the bicameral mind and also an organization called the Hearing Voices Network, which was set up by a Dutch guy called Roma, R-O-M-E, I think, and his wife. I can't remember their, his, her name. And these are people that deal with, with our uh, uh, hallucinations. And they're just as real and just as pertinent, you know. And one of the other guys was discussing about, you know, when they're in a hypnagogic state, they hear voices. And these voices talk and they come up with sometimes fairly profound statements um, as if they are independent of us in some way. You know, it's not just our subconscious talking, it's something more. So again, we can't just dismiss these things just because they're hallucinations, you know, they're, they're far more important. Um, and one of the other areas of hallucinations I'm particularly interested in is Charles Bonnet syndrome and the way in which people see tiny creatures walking around or they see people in three dimensions walking around them. Something here is intriguingly going on, which means that the world is much, much richer. And, you know, again, as, um, uh, as William Blake said in his poem, The Doors of Perception, you know, we've been locked within the, 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 the areas of our cavern and we see through the slits in the cavern. And what we need is for the, the doors of perception to be cleansed. And then we will see the universe as it really is infinite. And I think he is very true. I mean, it was the Songs of Innocence, I think, rather than the um, Doors of Perception as a title. But it's profoundly important. And I think it's uh, something that other science needs to look at. Um, yeah, I guess like, I, I, it wasn't specific enough. I, I, I meant uh, uh, hearing music, like uh, hearing a piece of music, like a symphony mm -hmm. or an orchestral piece. Um, I, I'm sorry, I kind of spaced out when I was <laughs> asking the question. So it's not really yeah, voices, th it's music. That's even more interesting, uh, music, musophilia, um, and the way in which certain people hear whole pieces of music. Um, you know, as, as Mozart himself said, you know, he heard the music in his head and just wrote it down. You know, he never ever claimed that his music was being created by him. It was being downloaded into his mind to do so. I mean, we hear the story, for instance, of um, Paul McCartney, the song Yesterday. That downloaded into his head. He heard it in a dream, and he wrote it when he came to. Now, oh, again, just going into that one, which I think will work well. If you ever go and listen to Revolver and Tomorrow Never Knows, it really fits into ego death and also the eternal return and other bits and pieces, which is fascinating, the lyrics. I will check that out. And particularly, for instance, John Lennon in um, his album Mind Games, you know, he was dealing with a specific book about altered states of consciousness that had been written by Jean Houston and her husband, whose name escapes me at the moment. But again, you know, that, that musicians know that this is a very, very curious event. I was only watching a program last night about Simon and Garfunkel and the way in which the song Bridge Over Troubled Water was created. And it literally, he was lying on his bed, Paul Simon, and he just heard the melody. The melody just came from nowhere. It came out of the, for want of a better term, the ether. And he wrote it down. So, but we know this for creativity. I mean, Kekul, who was the, the chemist who um, discovered the ring structure of benzene. He could not understand how benzene was structured, the benzene molecule. And literally one evening, he's looking into the fire in desperation. And he sees hovering around the fire a ring, ring structure, which was the ring structure of benzene. And he wrote it down and he realized that was the solution to his problem. He didn't know that, it was downloaded into him. There are cases after cases 
of inventions that have come from somewhere else. Uh, I'll give a fine, can I just very quickly, final example of this. Well, just is, to connect with um, that for you, Imaginal Traveller gets a lot of information which she has to sort out in her own head to try and sort things out, which is very similar to what you're describing. I don't know if well, she I wants think, to link into that yeah, after please, you finish please. yours. Yeah, just I'll give you one example and then Imaginal Traveller, it would be interesting to hear your take on this because there's somebody I could put you in touch with, is um, a guy uh, called... Um, Pia Rubessa, who I've worked with in the past. I first met him in his beautiful house on the banks of Lake Geneva in Montreux. And he, he has this beautiful house. And the reason he has a beautiful house, and he showed me this when I visited his house, and he has um, a group of um, bound volumes. And inside the volumes are handwritten diagrams written, and there's a code written in them. And I said, what are these? And he said, these are the things I've been downloading ever since my dear death experience. And he said, what happens is my daemon comes to speak to me and will say to me today, go to page 47. You will understand it. And he said, I read page 47, see the diagrams that I automatically created and I understand them. And I go away and I design a machine based upon the things that I drew. He's earned massive amounts of money. He, owe, he has a number of patents, including comparatively recently, he designed a machine that can sex eggs. Because one of the great problems is with, with, with eggs, when they're fertilized, hen's eggs, is that you don't, you don't want the, the cockerels. You only want the female hens. Um, and this, his machine can do it. He didn't invent this machine, it downloaded, the design downloaded into his head. Now, this is extraordinary. And again, what is even more interesting about this guy is he has in his possession an object he called the Octostone. It's of no known terrestrial mechanism. It's made of, again, almost like plasma. It's been tested at the universities in uh, the Netherlands and various other places. It's an unknown substance. And it was given to him by one of the entities that talks to him that started to manifest in his life. These are the kind of people I'm dealing with at the moment. And these are the kind of amazing things that we're discovering. So Imaginal Traveller, can you tell me a little bit about more about your stuff? Yes, we, we, need, to, we need to connect. <laughs> um, uh, my all the music uh, that came through me I wasn't a musician at the time I had played when I was a child but the <clears throat> excuse me the kundalini event um, brought through I started hearing all the music and it eventually became three albums of music and it was the dialogue between basically my music was mystical and about the dialogue with this presence um, the ET contact experiences um, <clears throat> were about uh, guiding me to to uh, rediscover this connection within myself and teaching me how to do it eventually. I'm talking decades. I've got about 20 journals since 1980 that um, is all, all the downloads. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sorry. It's, it's morning time here. Um, and... I just collect all this data, hundreds of transmissions from connecting to the field and bringing through these messages that, by the way, um, was anticipating uh, and uh, what happened <laughs> and what is happening now, uh, this grand shift in, uh, of the cycles um, and also connected to the Mayan uh, uh, I initiated in Tikal uh, walking the sacred Mayan fire path um, and learned uh, from that angle about what we're in right now in, in this grand cycle in the cosmos. So there's so much to talk about. It's really difficult to, you know, the story mm -hmm. of my life reducing this. To we, we, we must, we must recontact somewhere else and chat. Yeah. I, I mean, have this is this direct is... messaged you with her actual account so that you've got it in the direct messages with quite a lot of the important information that okay. has been sent today. OK, because this is the thing, isn't it? You know, that, that, that we are in a, an interesting period now, whether we necessarily, I would imagine that every group of people
people at any time will think that their times are special. Again, it's almost like the Hempel's dilemma I was talking about earlier on. But we are in intriguing times at the moment. And I, I readily agree that we are. Yes. And as I said earlier on, I think we're all being drawn together for a, for, for a purpose. Um, don't know what that purpose is at all at the moment. Um, maybe my Damon will tell me in due course. But yes. it... it it, it is intriguing and it really is quite fascinating. And I know that Piers stuff is mind blowing and he's, he's one of a number of people and like yourself who are doing extraordinary things. So thank you for sharing that. Yes. And I just want to thank you again for being uh, one of the rare bridges between, you know, the experiencer because you, you are as well, <laughs> you're the experiencer and the scientist as well. So you're a perfect bridge to, um, you know, have this conversation grow. So thank you for that. It has been uncomfortable being on the bridge for many years because effectively oh, what I'm tends sure. to happen is people throw stones at you from both sides. Um, so the, the real, real extreme new ages who want to believe in everything don't yes. like what I do because they considered me to be a skeptic. And of course, the scientists don't like what I'm doing because they believe I'm being an idiot and believing the things I believe in. So you get stones thrown from both sides. Um, I but we're getting bigger. That. I relate to that, but yes, it is growing. Um, but but it is it, it's a it's a feeling of being invisible, right? It's just like we've been invisible for so long. It's like I'm trying to scream these things out or or, or be heard and seen, and because it's important for humanity, not because I want somebody to pay attention to me. <laughs> I want to share what I have learned over the course of my whole life. Um, that is, and, that is, yeah. Sorry, go on. No, you go that, ahead. That was basically okay. It. I was going to say that is such an important point. And people ask me and say, well, why do you write? Um, why do you, <laughs> you know, and I write because it's what I have to do. I'm not doing it for fame. I'm definitely not doing it for fortune. Um, I do it because I genuinely believe in it. And I don't, I don't want to make huge amounts of money out of it, probably because that would maybe change me. I don't know. And also, you know, I'm not after fame. I want the ideas to get out there, not me, not the cult of Anthony Peake. You know, it, that, that's not what I'm about. That's okay. You know, we won't turn that into a cult for you. We don't do cults here. We just come as a we community. Don't do cults. Well, we have been yes. we have been thinking about the cult. You know, sort of um, we have jokingly discussed the the whole potential of how I could. And as I've said to this many times to people, if I really wanted to get this out there, I could just turn around and say I'm channeling it from the planet Tharg, and say that exactly. I'm in contact with ascended masters, and people would yes. buy my books by the shed load. We could would. be so rich. We could be so rich if we would play to the ego, right? Oh, totally. Totally. But we don't. And we don't because, I guess, does uh, you, you guys come across Maslow's hierarchy of needs at all? Um, it might be uh, worthwhile so, yes. doing a summarization for the rest of the people. Okay. Abraham Maslow was uh, a psychologist who, in, I think, the 1960s, um, came up with quite brilliant but simple viewpoint on life is the needs that we have. Now, effectively, if you've got no clothes, no shelter and no food, there's certain needs that you have to fulfill very quickly. So you have to find food and water to survive. So that's the lowest need you need. Having then done that, you've got to find shelter and then you've got to find warmth. And then it builds up like a pyramid of all the things that you need and the very last thing you need is what's called self-actualization. And that is feeling that you're part of the greater humanity, feeling that what you're doing is for the greater good of everybody. And effectively attuning into the fact, as I've said many times, that we're one consciousness experiencing itself subjectively. And the realization of the loss of ego, because ego is pointless, you know, that we are just all one and self-actualization is a profound importance and sometimes i just get the idea that that's where we're trying to move to you know i i of course i have ego everybody has ego you know it is but i genuinely believe that what i'm doing is what i have to do it's not a question of wanting to do it's have to do and to do these things and invest time 
in doing these things. I mean, I find it's sometimes really difficult because I have literally tens of thousands of people around the world who want my time, want my attention, uh, want to talk to me and everything. And unfortunately, because I'm not rich, I don't, and I'm not a, a particularly famous writer to that extent. So I don't have a secretary and I don't have people watching my emails. My wife does, well, I have an accountant, but my wife does my accounts for me and keeps me on the, the, the steady line. Um, because I don't have support. People think, you know, that, you know, that I, I have lots of people supporting me. I don't, it's just me. So when I don't respond to people on Facebook, they get really quite upset with me. They don't realize that, you know, I, I can get 40 or 50 messages a day on Facebook and that's without going on to um, Instagram and everywhere else. And I just can't humanly possibly respond to everybody. And I know I miss out on people and I know I upset people because I don't respond. It's not because I'm not interested. Believe me, it's not. It's not me. And everybody who knows me and everybody who's met me and knows me personally, like Paul, knows that, you know, I'm, I'm, as, I'm as approachable as I can possibly make myself. I can vouch you know. for you. And I'll do this now. I've known you probably for over five years, at least. And when we first started communicating via Messenger, I understood that life gets in the way of doing things and you can get busy. And then one day he was doing a talk in London. He said he was going to be in a location at lunchtime would I like to go there and oddly enough me and my partner we turned up had a wonderful conversation before the actual book launch for open the doors to perception meeting JB Priestley's son and also his grandson Luke and other people and it was as she said we sat down at the table with loads of people that we didn't know and it was like being there with friends and the conversation just flowed she was impressed we met another friend who then came to Watkins bookshop they came in, they were blown away with the speech and also the other topics that were going on at the same time. And then he was kind enough to say one time when I was going up for another speech in another location, he was there for lunch. I thought I was going up to be there with other people, but I was actually there and had a wonderful two hours just talking to him. So he's very approachable when the time is available. And again, you can't be any other way. Absolutely. Thank you, Paul. That was very nice to say. I saw Gabe and Renegade put their hands up. I think Gabe was first. Melissa, wasn't he? And then Renegade? Yes, uh, Gabe was first. Yeah. Gabe, can you hear us? <laughs> <laughs> I think we're playing Chase Gabe. Have you got traffic <laughs> to say uh, behind hello? you? Hey, right. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Answer. can hear you, yeah. Okay, sorry, yeah. sorry, sorry. I think I had to switch off on the phone. Uh, yeah, I was just uh, just going to interject on, on stuff that Imagino was talking about with the downloading. <clears throat> um, yeah, there's there's been times where I will get like a uh, uh, a thought in my head or even in dreams, you know, I'd, I'd be using... Uh, some sort of machinery. I don't know what it is. I don't know how it was made. And, and it would have a specific function. And I would say that that doesn't exist, you know, but then, um, you know, hearing about the, the guy who downloads uh, all of his inventions, I was like, wow, uh, I'm wondering if I'm getting some of these plans, but I don't know what to do with them. Well, that's exactly what he said to me. He said, he said I don't know what to do with these things, but I then, realize and know what to do with them um and i think all we need to do i, I think again this is the daemon communicating with us uh, and sometimes the daemon because it can't communicate effectively in the way it would like it has to speak in code or use whatever methods it can in order to get its message across but of course the mystery of the daemon is that the daemon is you it's just you that's lived many lives um uh, that's had many runs through your life it's played your game of life many times and it just wants to make sure that it gets you to the place it wants you to be now this is of profound importance here because people turn around to me and say well why has the daemon got me in the present position where i'm unhappy and, and everything else and i'm saying because it's it's doing interception planning it's getting you into the right mental state and the right physiological state and everything else to 
to have that happen to you at the right moment when you're ready for it. You know, and I know from my own personal experience that I went through an awful lot of pain and difficulty um, for a few years before I read, I wrote Cheating the Ferryman or, or wrote my books. And I know why I had to go through that pain, because had I not gone through that pain, and it was me being selfish with other people, by the way. It wasn't, it wasn't done to me. It was me doing unto others. Um, and I realized that I had to realize how selfish I had become to realize that life is really precious. And I wanted to be in a position of knowing that I could put right the wrongs that I'd done to people. And the science then developed itself to make me realize that I will have the opportunities to go back and put wrong, put right the wrongs I have done in this life and probably have done in many other lives where I've hurt people. And I've thought, my God, I wish I hadn't done that. And I, you know, I can, I can honestly say that really for many of my, you know, many vast parts of my life, I was not a very nice person. I was a very arrogant, full of myself, womanizing prat you know um who really was vain and full of himself and everything else and i look back at that person now and i think my god you were just awful but that's the way i had to be in order to be me now i had to go through that and i had to go through that those stages and i think this was with all of us we're all just learning you know and that's why my argument is that there's no there's no point in having just one life because if you have one life as yourself, how can you ever learn by your mistakes? How can you ever grow? Like in reincarnation, the idea is you die and then you're reborn as somebody else with no memories of your previous life. To me, it's much more important to be reborn as me, to meet the people I love again and to meet those people and interact with them again, with my mother and my father and my sister and all my friends that have died over the years, that I know I'll re-meet them again and be able to say the things that I should have said to them last time. If I'm reincarnated, I can't do that, if that makes sense. This is why it works for me. It may not work for you guys, but it works for me. And it works for me to for have the opportunity to just say sorry or hug somebody when I should have hugged them last time, knowing that that's the last time I've ever going to see them alive. I think and it, it does has because, happened. sorry for interrupting, but the so, whole of us going through all the things we've ever gone through if we never went through them, we'd never make these connection points and suddenly be in the same location now. For example, mm -hmm. meeting up with Melissa as in Centered Awareness, that was just pure chance. Something kind of drove me to say, I must actually physically talk to this person. And again, it's just been amazing because the connection point, everybody else in the community just organically grew. Same with Richard as in RN Vuk. We just become one massive community of like-minded, helpful people who will promote the seven shades out of everybody else to make sure they can find other information and get the best possible results. Well, it's important here to, 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 to consider on this because one of my favorite novelists or short story writers is Jorge, Jorge Borges, the, the great Argentinian writer. And one of his famous short stories is called The Garden of the Forking Paths. And it's the idea that all our, all our lives are like a, a garden full of paths that we can take different routes in different ways and we can follow them a myriad number of times. But what is interesting is every person in this room now and every person who's listening in now, think about this that your life has been a series of coincidences and chance meetings and chance discoveries to get you to be here now at this moment. This is the, 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 the point where all of your lives, all of our lives have all been working together to reach this point now and having these conversations and these discussions. And if you think about that, it then becomes extraordinary. And it suddenly becomes that there is some kind of blueprint or plan or something. In, in philosophical terms, it's called teleology. The idea that there's an end point and there's a reason for everything. Now, in, in terms of, of general science, you know, everything is just arbitrary. It's all chance 
and, and there is there is no reason for anything. It just is it's arbitrary. I don't believe that. I believe there is reasons behind this and there are forces behind this that's making this happen in one way or another. And we're all meeting. And it's another point I say to people when I do my public lectures and I say, don't you think it's extraordinary that you in your life have witnessed other people dying? People have died in your life. You've lost people and seen them go, but you're still here. And I think that's a profoundly subtle observation. And it is to do directly with a theme that I've spoke about in a number of my books and will be featuring in my next book in great detail called The Quantum Suicide Experiment, which was first put forward by a guy called Max Tegmark. I have to say uh, that we quote that a lot in our web our community. I think everyone will show a hand that we do do that quite nicely. And the experiment video on YouTube, the one that you showed us about the guy sitting in the chair is the one that we kind of uh, push around. Because it's excellent, isn't it? Because the idea is that if you are collapsing the wave function of your Everett universe, there is no circumstances where you can not be because you are the witness to it. Um, unless, as there was a famous poem um, by was it Robert Fawn? No, it wasn't Robert Fawn. It was somebody else. E, uh, Knox, Robert Knox. And it goes somewhere along the lines of um, God uh, is the tree in the quad. Is the tree in the quad when there's nobody there in the quad? And then there's a reply which says the tree will continue to be within the quad because I'm always there. You're sincerely God. And the idea is that there is the ultimate observer of everything that creates everything. Then there is the, the observing consciousnesses that draw up the information field in one way or another. And I think although, I, I mean, I'm probably a theist, um, but I, I don't affix to any religion or any religious belief, but there is this kind of logic that we are in some way part of a collective consciousness which of course is what the Vedantists would say we're all the thought of Brahman it's what the Kabbalists would say in terms of we're all all emanations of the or Ain Sof and again in my new book I go into massive detail about the model I'm talking about now and it works you know and, and we are all here together for a reason and and we are just like all my Facebook friends and when we when when it resonates perfectly as it's doing now, you get this feeling of energy that just emanates from everybody, you know. And I'm energized now, and I'm energized because I'm getting the feedback from you guys. You know, it's extraordinary. I'm glad you said that because it is just, as I say, it's difficult to describe. And all these people all came in different locations. I know Renegades popped back in again. Melissa, he did have his hand up, and then it would be tomorrow, yeah. Melissa? Yeah, sorry, my head, I've had to recharge my headphones. Um, told you to get wired ones. I told you. <laughs> rechargeable are no good in these situations. I um, thought you were saying you have to recharge your head. And I thought, wow, this is, <laughs> this is blowing your mind to such an extent. You've got a head recharge. You need that on your CV. I did this to Melissa. Yeah, we absolutely. Did. You know, by the way, guys, really... by the way, guys, I can I can stay for another 10 minutes, probably maximum, if that's OK. That's not a problem. I can't believe that you've been able to give us almost five hours of your time today. And I think everybody here will appreciate the time that you've given and probably tweet something wonderful and amazing about you. If you don't, I'll come and find you, all my community. Please just, sh just share it with everybody, please. This is so important on Facebook. Share it. Share, share the, the whole ideas I have, not because of me, but to get it out there. So oh, please, you know, within your networks, please just please share it. Once we need I set to up make the podcast. this a worldwide movement. We need to make this a movement. And the only way we can do that is by making it go viral. It's the only way. Sorry, Absolutely. again, to the questions. That's OK. I was just going to say, we are going to do that with the podcast and have these out there and obviously do short ones with people. And then say, sometimes you might want to hear this large round table or we'll cut it into chunks and do that and just get it around to people. So, Renegade, did you have a brief question? I think all questions are going to have to be brief. But we've only got a limited amount of time. I do have uh, some sort of a side note. Uh, you were mentioning uh, uh, Simon and Garfunkel, and I think the song of Paul Simon, which is called uh, The Sound of Silence, is very amazing to listen uh, again, and maybe again and again. Because in this song, 
there is a profound message about being silenced and being connected with what people call God, Brahman, whatever you want to name it. So I yeah. think uh, it's nice to uh, listen to this song after this talk and you might see some uh, synchronicities appear. Because and the words of the prophets are written on the subway walls. This is not just a synchronicity, this is almost a recognition because I played that song yesterday uh, and I played the album, The Sound of Silence, yesterday from start to finish because I love it so much. And I've loved that album since I first heard it in the early 1970s. And The Sound of Silence is so profound. So, Renegade, thank you so much for, 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 for saying that. And yes, check yeah, it out. It I don't know what, what, why this popped up, but this kept on repeating in my mind that I have to say this. And uh, yeah. There you go. That's the reason. That's yes. the reason. And uh, this whole talk uh, yeah, feels like one big deja vu. And sometimes it's uh, exhausting to uh, figure it out in your mind, but it's also very energizing, like you said before. So thank you. Wonderful. All. Thank you. Right, so we can make this the final question, I think. So it gives me time to prepare. Sorry about that, guys, but I really I, I have to get on with something else. Um, so can I take a final question and then we can sum up? Yeah, I think tomorrow was next. Oh, well, I had less of a question and more of a comment. So I, I'd leave it to somebody else with a real question. So which out of Estevel? Oh, Rico had his hand up first. And then obviously Estevel, if they're very quick. Then they I might don't get have two a question. I just, I just wanted to say on something I've been thinking about and seeing happen with you were talking about technology and the um, virtual reality. And I think that the daemon or the I would say the um, Akashic field uh, of information is trying to tap through all of us right now. And these, these, they're trying to break the barrier with spaces and with the, uh, virtual reality. And so I just think that technology is pushing this and psilocybin and DMT and people that are working on this. So I'm really excited just to be here. And I just, I just want to say thank you for everything you said. So, I, I, Rico, I think that is absolutely such a, an interesting comment and observation. I think that, and I've said this many times in my interviews, that the time is right now for this kind of material because in previous generations, people will not necessarily understand the message because they wouldn't understand the concept of virtual reality. They wouldn't understand the idea that you can create reality and walk within it. Whereas now we understand it. So people are open to the ideas so we couldn't have done it. I mean, I feel, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm towards the end of my life now. And I feel, wouldn't it be better if I'd done it in my 30s or 40s rather than in my 60s? But if I had not done it now, it wouldn't have been the right time. If I'd done it in the 1970s, people wouldn't even vaguely appreciate the, the, the physics hadn't evolved enough. The, the knowledge of the universe hadn't evolved enough. Whereas now is right. The time is right. The synergy is there. It's a very good, very good observation, and I totally agree with you on that. Thanks, Rico. Estevel, you're going to have to be really quick, I think. Hi, thanks, uh, Paul. Uh, hello, nice uh, listening in. Um, yeah, I have to be really quick, but <laughs> I don't know if my question is, uh, I don't know. Uh, there's so many things I've been listening to about, uh, don't you know. ramble, the, uh, Estevel, be quick. <laughs> yeah, I have to, okay. So it, you talk about the, the daemon or it, um, so it's spirit, and you, you said this, uh, like, someone who invented a machine for for seeing the, the sex of the eggs but like just something more mundane we all have dreams and i've had these these really weird dreams and i'm wondering it because one is really mundane and the other was it's completely i can't go into details because i have to be really quick but are those like also downloads what what, what are your thoughts on that because I, I really feel like I have to talk about my dreams with, with someone but this is not the right time but like can you can you give me your view on that. I don't know if this makes sense. Estevel, no, he will it be coming no, it back does. to us. Because I think, I'm not sure if Estevel realized that you did say that you would like to have a monthly kind of get together. Yeah, so at no, some point I think we can we schedule should, some questions, but a quick overview for him. Yeah, but in terms of dreaming, dreaming quite fascinates me. And again, um, if you take the opportunity, uh, my book, The Out of Body Experience, I have a whole section on lucid dreaming and also about what dreaming actually is. Because dreaming is is, again, 
an alternate reality that we we inhabit and we go into um and we go we all experience it you know most of us experience dreaming and what is dreaming your 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 um your your senses are being stimulated in exactly the same way as they are in consensual reality um it's just it lacks cohesion or it lacks sense or it indeed lacks the sense of self because when we're dreaming we don't seem to realize necessarily who we are but there is a group of my friends who are doing active research in lucid dreaming where they are becoming conscious in their dreams i mean there's one friend of mine she's she she visits a place she calls future Mos future tokyo and she's mapping the environment of future tokyo there's another friend of mine when he goes into his dream states he's mapping his uh, he goes around this school and he's mapping the city around the school so dreaming is very important and i think as a final point now, uh, as I say, I, you know, you guys can go on talking for as long as you like. That's great. Um, but one of the things that would be very useful um, if maybe in a month's time we got together and did another long session like this. But what I would really advise if you check out my material, um, my YouTube channel, Anthony Peak um, on YouTube, where I have lots of interviews with people backing up the ideas I put forward. And if you have the opportunity, just read some of my books. If you, don't read, if you don't want to read them, that's not a problem because they're also on Audible, three of them. So you can actually listen to my dulcet tones going on. There's a fourth one that's been read by an actor. Um, there are also, and you don't need to buy them. I, you, you know, it's not important that you buy them. You can order them from your local libraries. They're in libraries across um, uh, the United States and the UK. I, know, I noticed, for instance, there's a number of them in the New York libraries at the moment, so you can order them. Um, also, you know, sort of just my general interviews as well, because if you've then got some kind of idea of where I'm coming from, we can really have an interesting discussion and debate where you can understand mm -hmm. some of the terminology I use. There's quite precise terminology involved. I mean, we are Itladians. Uh, Itlad is the title of my first book and people who follow my books call themselves Itladians. Um, we have all kinds of concepts such as the Damon Adelon dyad, which is the Damon and the Adelon relationship. There is the Bohmian IMAX, which is the, 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 the simulation that we live within. Lots and new, lots of terminologies, and a lot of my associates now use these on a regular basis um, because they, they, need, they are quite precise terms in what they do. But if you check out my work, and um, but you don't have to. I mean, it, it's not important. It's important that I have your feedback as to your own experiences. And then I can then inwardly digest those and come up with new ideas. But again, thank you very much um, for everybody involved here. I really, really, really have enjoyed it. It's been five hours and it's fine extraordinary that we're still going strong and could probably go for another five quite easily. That is so true. Um, I have to say, thank you again so much for your time and dedication to coming to us for the first time and just for an experiment, it's gone so well. For those who want to actually come off their mic now and just give their appreciation, that'd be great. And again, tweeting everything out as much as possible is the thing to do. Yeah, thank, thank you. you very much. I, I will thank say you. there were so many times, Anthony, that you were speaking and I was looking at the emojis that we had available to react to what you were saying. And I was like, there really needs to be something here that says, my mind is blown because <laughs> there wasn't any, <laughs> there was nothing there that I was like, oh, how can I? Thank you so much. I'm so glad that Paul, you know, brought you in and um, and and we this worked really well without any technical issues. I mean, if this happened last week, it, we we were thrown out of our room for like three times. I think it was. Yeah. So I'm really glad that everything went really smoothly and that a lot of people showed up and a lot of people got a lot out of this, which is great. And so civil as well. There was no Absolutely. arguments or over talking, which is fantastic yeah. by everybody. Much appreciated. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you very much, guys. And by the way, just to go as a coincidence, my um, my remote headphones, Bluetooth headphones, have just told me my battery is just about to go, which is absolutely perfect. So obviously, Glad we could test the them powers, for you. <laughs> the powers that be obviously wanted this one to go ahead. We have a running joke with my group called the Archons, um, which seem to sort of come up and sort of cause problems. But the Archons seem to not be around today, so maybe they're happy with the message to get out. Okay, guys, wonderful to speak to you all. Speak to you all hopefully in a month's time, and uh, I'll contact Paul and we'll make an arrangement. Okay, thanks again. See you all. Bye. Once bye. again, so much. Bye. Thank bye. you. Thank bye. you. Bye. To help our research and understanding, leave Perceptions Today's podcast reviews, subscribe to the podcast, along with the other social media accounts, and share. Come and join our live events. 
That way we can get together and have thoughtful discussions along with advancing our understanding of concepts as we go along. <laughs>